Join us today for an exciting episode on the art of fabric manipulation. Whether you're a novice eager to try shearing or a seasoned pro ready to tackle more complex techniques, today's discussion will cover it all. Grab your elastic thread and prepare to fold, pleat, and gather your way through techniques that will have your garments looking runway ready in no time. Hello and welcome to Threaded Together, a podcast that stitches together home sewing and high fashion. We're your hosts. I'm Tracy. I'm Rebecca. And in today's episode, we'll be discussing fabric manipulation. This is our 20th episode, season two, episode eight for Threaded Together. We are so excited to have you. And we're thrilled to have you back listening to us again. There has been a lot of interest in our monthly newsletter that goes out exactly one week following the release of each episode. We always publish on the last Tuesday of the month. And then the newsletter will pop into your inbox the first Tuesday of every month. Month, so one week later. It has behind the scenes photos of what we've been making and is always evolving. So to make sure it's as easy as possible to sign up, there is now a dedicated sign up page on our website. In our bios, we'll include it in the show notes as well. So make sure you check that out. And behind the scenes, Tracy and I are building some exciting things that will be released first and foremost to newsletter subscribers. So you'll want to make sure you're on that list. It's a really great way to keep in touch and see what we've been up to behind the scenes. I even actually share some pictures of some of my makes, which I think long time listeners will know. I'm not particularly good at sharing photos, so it's a good way to see behind the scenes. But we have been in the newsletter. <laughs> Starting off with something current. Well, Tracy, I feel like it's been a very long month. You were reminding me of some of the things I watched and I was like, that was that was this month. I know it's been an action-packed month with sunshine and holidays. It definitely feels like a long time since our last episode. But you did give me a couple of holiday viewing recommendations. Can you share them with us? Yes. So sometimes since our last episode, I watched two fashion-related shows that are both fairly new. One was the miniseries Becoming Karl Lagerfeld, and the other was the Galliano documentary High Low John Galliano that I think we've mentioned in the past. Mm -hmm but I hadn't gotten around to watching it. The Lagerfeld miniseries was interesting in contrast with some of the other designer series that came out this year. I read an article that compared the Lagerfeld series with the Balenciaga miniseries, and it said that the Balenciaga series led with the fashion and then had the characters as the supporting cast. But Becoming Lagerfeld was incredibly character-driven, led by the German actor Daniel Brühl, who is absolutely magnetic playing the perpetually restrained Karl Lagerfeld. Mm -hmm. The series also has a lot of Yves Saint Laurent, not just as an individual, but also in the costuming. And as someone who loves studying vintage YSL pieces, I almost fell out of my chair in a scene where I swear the room was either wearing the actual runway pieces mm -hmm. or perfect replicas. It was like visual candy, which just made the series so much more enjoyable. And you've been watching it too, I think you said, Tracy. Yeah, that's right. I am midway through it and I have definitely been enjoying it. It's very, very good. Oh, I'm glad. And as far as the Galliano documentary, they have everyone who's anyone in it, including one of our favorite people, Amanda Harlick, who... Galliano famously dropped when he moved to Dior, only to be picked up by Karl Lagerfeld and brought to Chanel. I had a lot of thoughts immediately after watching Hilo Galliano, and I'm hesitant to really endorse it because I'm not sure it did tons to enrich my life now that I've had a little bit of distance since seeing it. I do think there are better series such as The Kingdom of Dreams if you want a good picture of the time period. But again, I mean, these things are always worth watching to form your own opinions. Have you been getting a chance to watch anything else interesting, Tracy? Well, you also recommended to me the show Jeremy Scott, The People's Designer, which I, mm -hmm. I also enjoyed. Very good. I'm glad that you are enjoying them. And 
one more thing. I don't know if you watch Emily in Paris at all, Tracy, but I've been seeing some really interesting things on the internet about the costuming in particular, a rather show-stopping Nina Ricci piece that was designed for the show. Mm -hmm. But I haven't watched the last season yet. I'm waiting to do so with my husband. So maybe something for us to watch and discuss by the next episode. Yeah, I agree. I haven't watched it yet because they've got it in two drops, haven't they? And I, I'd binge it in one go rather than watch it and have a few weeks to forget what happened. So um, I'm going to save it up. Good point. Good point. We are really excited to talk about fabric manipulation. But of course, before we get into that, what have you been working on in the last month, Tracy, that maybe isn't related to today's topic? Well, I finished a dress we spoke about last time, and then I had big plans for my August sewing. But in researching this episode, I fell in love with a dress and then I had to recreate it. And so I've been busy twirling a dress um, inspired by one of the designers that we'll mention later. And so that that's the only sewing I've done is twirling. No, but that's so fantastic. We'll have to see photos of that. And we'll see how hope, it turns out. Well, I hope later you'll you'll share more about the dress as well. Because, yeah, that's going to be gorgeous. And <laughs> what about you? You've had a busy sewing month, I believe. I have, yeah. I finished a trouser prototype that I've had on my to-do list for over a year. And it's made out of the same fabric as my couch, which means I can now camouflage quite easily while binge-watching TV. <laughs> Some just leftover fabric I had there. I also finished making a new pattern from a vintage jumpsuit and then made a new version out of this fantastic vintage garden fabric. And Tracy, you and I were messaging constantly while I was making that. And there were some sewing hacks that came out of it. But perhaps most impactful for me was it was my first time using Procreate, which is a software available on Apple products, to envision how the pattern was going to look ahead of time. And it completely changed the jumpsuit so that pattern placement ended up almost looking like a scarf print and it was just so much fun getting to share that and I do actually have a full YouTube on the pattern drafting process and I include the procreate bit if anyone's curious to check it out but that was really fun and then lastly it was a busy sewing month I finished my sweet home Alabama sheer dress look at you finishing what you said you finished last month I know I feel like I'm overachieving it's great but this was my first time sharing which I was doing for this episode and I didn't use a pattern but we can share more on that later um, but I did make the dress out of a silk linen blend that I've used before and did pre-shrink yay <laughs> of course I told you about that Tracy and then I had a mint green tool overlay on it that I think created a really interesting effect as they were sheared together but I'll get into more of what that experience was like when we get into discussing sharing a bit more. So why are we covering fabric manipulation today? And the inspiration for this episode initially came from that dress that you wanted to make. Right, Rebecca? Yeah, that and you had also serendipitously gotten a new book on the subject as well that wasn't the same one that I had. That's right. I just got a copy of Fabric Manipulation, 150 Creative Sewing Techniques by Ruth Singer. And I have a fabulous book I referenced as well, The Art of Fabric Manipulation by Colette Wolf. And I've had this book almost since I started sewing, yet I've I'd never prior to this month ever put it into practice. I'd never tried any of the techniques. Whereas you were just getting this new book, Tracy, but I think you'd already done some fabric manipulation before, right? Yeah, I've played around with a few of the techniques that we'll discuss today, but mainly because I've followed a pattern that has included it rather than um, setting out to try that technique first of all. Oh, but I still think, I think that's so amazing. And I think hearing that and then also having the interest and appreciation of the techniques. I know I have Pinterest boards full of instructions and examples for different types of smocking, folding, et cetera. But that combined with, honestly, I think my fear and intimidation at trying them out in real life is one of the reasons I, I really want to do this episode. And it's proved such a fruitful process, not only getting me past that first barrier of trying, but also in our discovery of just how vast and interesting of a topic fabric manipulation is. For example, we were getting ready for this episode and how to structure it. And we found we had a lot of conflicting information, even between our like two reference texts. 
For example, my book categorized different techniques under either controlled crushing, supplementary fullness, systematic folding, gathered reliefs, and then structured surfaces. Yeah, whereas my book, the categories of plea and fold, stitch and gather, and apply and layer. <laughs> so we were also discussing what went where. So, so for example, there are ruffling techniques that you could argue could also fall under gathering or under adding volume depending on which you use i mean even some of the pronunciations were up for debate exactly so we decided that that's how we're going to approach this acknowledging the vastness of the topic while we discuss the options for different techniques when you use which and references to see these in action high fashion pieces all with the purpose of peeling back some of the mystique that might surround some of these techniques and hopefully inspiring all of us to get a bit more daring with our willingness to try them. Mm -hmm. That sounds like the perfect introduction. Fabric manipulation is about the variety of techniques and processes that can be used to alter the texture and appearance of fabrics. And there's so many techniques and ideas that we can't possibly cover them all. But we hope today to give you lots of ideas and inspiration for your makes and we'll also give some ideas and suggestions of patterns that will allow you to incorporate these techniques into your makes. A lot of the techniques that we're discussing today take a length of fabric and reduce its size. And the most basic form of reducing volume in an unstructured way is through gathering. Gathering is also a category of its own as well as a technique, but in terms of how it's accomplished, you use a machine or hand sew through a length of fabric and then draw that fabric together along the thread to bunch up or bring the fabric closer together than it would lay naturally on its own. Gathering can be functional, so like on a sleeve head where you gather along an edge to create shaping on the top of the sleeve that allows you to ease it into the armhole. It can also be decorative. Think of a high-necked garment with a gather in the center of the neck or a dress with a gather at one side of the body to create a draped layer effect on the skirt. Or even a one-sided gather where an extra piece is added to a skirt that is gathered in such a way that it doesn't fully ruffle but instead allows the lower part of the skirt to flare out further than the gathered top of the skirt. And that leads to a great question. When do gathers become ruffles? When fabric is gathered along one edge and left loose or flared on the other, it forms a ruffle. So many dress patterns of recent years have had tiers to the skirt where the top of the tier is gathered to then create a ruffle at the bottom. So an intentional frilled detail to the dress rather than a controlled gather where you're gathering in to, into something. That is a really clever way to use a gather. And there's also some other interesting ways to use gathers and cutouts, such as on a side of a dress where the gather creates a figure forming circular cutout. Now, I don't know if anyone else enjoys this or I'm just strange, but I really enjoy cruising Pinterest and studying block adjusting diagrams to get different pattern shapes. Not saying I ever use them. I just like <laughs> looking at them. And one day I came across how to add this modification of a gathered cutout to a basic dress block. And I was surprised at how much fabric has to get added. It's almost like a slash and spread like you do on the top of a sleeve head to get this big puffy sleeve, only that fabric gets added just above like the waist where your cutout's going to be. And then all of that extra material gets pulled into the cutout to maintain the shape of the garment. I'll try to see if I can find that link. It was really, really interesting. Oh, yeah, I'd love to see that. I... I would really like to see that. But what I'd like to do is share my favourite method for gathering because there's a few techniques you can play around with. There's some that involve like dental floss where you use your normal thread to zigzag over a straight line of dental floss and then you simply hold the floss and gather your fabric. Oh, that sounds brilliant. <laughs> dental floss, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Or you could use a gathering foot if you have one for your machine. And um, for that, you'll need to play around with the tension and the stitch length to make sure that you get the right amount of gathering for the fabric you're working with to the area you want to fit it to. Honestly, though, I prefer to stick to the, the tried and true method. But I put a different colour in my bobbin thread because then I can differentiate between the top and bottom thread and make sure I'm pulling out the right fabric afterwards. Do you get a better result by pulling on the 
bobbin thread than on the top thread. And if it's a fabric that I can get away with unpicking, I'll do two to three lines of basting stitches with one of the lines outside of the seam line. But if I can't get away with unpicking, I'll only stitch like within the seam allowance. I mean, I'll still unpick it, but you know, it's just so that I, I'm not, not eating into my main fabric. And if it's a particularly long amount to gather, so like if you think of a hem of a skirt or something, I think I've done somewhere where it's like, you know, five metres of fabric that you're wrestling with, I'll break it up mm -hmm. into sections and that allows more even gathers rather than trying to eyeball how, how evenly it is. And then as well, it's also helpful, I guess, to tie off the ends before you start gathering to kind of mitigate against any overzealous gathering and pulling mm -hmm. the thread through. We've all been there, right? Do you have a preferred gathering technique, Rebecca? Yeah, I do. I think it's the same as yours, Tracy, just yeah. the tried and true basting stitch yeah, yeah, with really long threads left at either end. But I do like your secondary color to know which which is your bobbin thread. But I, I like that technique versus a gathering foot because I think it gives you so much control over the gathers and how easily you can adjust it until you get it exactly right. You can move it around. You can, you know, take out the gather and, and readjust. So once you've mastered the straightforward single edge gather, you can start to have a lot of fun. So like if you imagine the effects of gathering on a bias strip or double edge gather so where you're where you're gathering both ends of your strip of fabric or maybe where one is gathered to a different length to the other sewing a double row of gathers like that's visible or ruffling layers of fabric like there's so much fun that you can have or you could ruffle fabric that's already shaped or gather multiple rows and I guess that leads us very nicely onto our next item. Oh, it does. But quickly before that, you've just sparked in my head, Tracy. There's a popular shirt design. I feel like I've seen lately where it's a basic like long sleeve kind of crew neck t-shirt, but with diagonal rows of contrasting gathers. Oh, it's something that I feel like has been pretty popular as of late, but would be a fun way to play around with that with like a otherwise fairly straightforward shape of just a long sleeve crew neck with yeah contrasting gathers so Ooh. I'll see if I can find a photo to add in because yeah, that, that just popped into my mind with your description yeah. but speaking of gathering in multiple rows that leads us to shearing and shearing is another form of gathering but it's defined by having multiple rows of gathers something we commonly think of with shearing is that it has a stretch element to it to give you a visual when you see dresses with lots of gathered stitching either across the bust or in the center back of the dress in rows that shearing it's often used in that area of the body because it allows a comfortable adjustable fit with elastic that also makes the garment more form-fitting and eliminates the need for an additional closure on the garment tracy i messaged you when i was confirming the technique i was going to use use on just like how to do shearing. So would you mind sharing your preferred techniques? Yes, I will. But can we start with how do you pronounce it? I've heard both sharing and shearing and sharing. And I think sharing is right, but I'm not sure. I guess we'd welcome feedback on this. Okay, so I, I went looking for the etymological origins of the word <laughs> and ended up finding something really interesting about the history of shearing. But according to the Dictionary of Fashion History by Valerie Cumming, shearing may originate from the German of schüren, which would corroborate that emphasis. And I played it on the Oxford Dictionary and they agreed. So apparently I'm saying it wrong and it should be shuring with a long <laughs> U sound. But what, in this deep dive, what I thought was really fascinating, though, is the word and technique of shuring have their first reference in the 19th century when sewing machines were first invented. So it was initially a way to mechanically smock, essentially. It's really interesting stuff. So sharing is, and that is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a few techniques of sharing. So one is like gathering, 
But after multiple rows, you ease the gathers as much as you need to. And I guess that's that's where the original name for it came from, as that that's a bit like smocking, as we'll come to later. Another is to do the same, but with a gathering foot. And another, and this is the one we're all the most familiar with, I think, and what we immediately think of when we, when we think of sharing. Um, and that's to do it with sharing elastic. So to do this, you get yourself some sharing elastic, hand wind it onto a bobbin. And this can take a bit of practice to get the tension right because you want it not too tight and not too loose. Mm. And then the you put your normal thread in the top of the machine and a slightly longer stitch than normal, but not too long. And again, this is one you want to practice on scraps for this because every mis- machine is like slightly different and it's going to vary on your fabric and the effect you want and... Yeah, it takes takes a bit of practice, I think, to get the consistency and tension right. And that that's the kind of technique, really. Sharing is about multiple parallel rows of stitching. And you'll find with each next row, you'll need to give it a little stretch as you sew your fabric through because your fabric will become more and more gathered on each row because it's oh, it's got that elastic pull on it. And again, that can take a bit of practice to kind of get the tension right as you're feeding it through. It can also get a bit messy when you're trying to make sure you sew in a straight line. So it can help to have pre-marked your rows with chalk or use your foot as a guide to make sure you're sewing the next row at a foot's width or I mean the best thing to do is share on gingham or something similar where you already have a clear line to follow. That's that's such a good point Tracy. I kind of regretted that I didn't chalk my lines yeah. before yeah. on my dress and then found yeah I had to kind of stretch before I hit the the foot in order to get it fairly straight yeah yeah but you can't pull it too too much because you don't want to adjust that tension yeah 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 and then back stitching can get a bit of a i mean my machine doesn't like back stitching with sharing at all so you might find it's best to not off your threads or get to the next row by sewing in a continuous line so like a c curve or or a reverse c curve to the next row though it, it being kind of mindful of your seam allowance and ensuring that your turn is within the seam allowance and not in your main fabric. I find, I don't know whether this is just me, that you only ever get a few rows out of a bobbin though. And so it's important to keep an eye on that and make sure you'll make the next row (laughs) because you don't want to, don't want to run out of sharing elastic midway through a row. Yeah. And the best tip for sharing is when it's done is to give it a really good steam. Hover your steamy iron above the sharing and it's amazing to see how much it will shrink and neaten up your stitches. Yeah, absolutely. I concur completely nodding off your threads. And even it's like I did run out mid bobbin probably every <laughs> every other row three rows yeah. yeah so what i what i did was i unpicked a little bit where it had stopped mid row mm-hmm. and then started a little bit ahead so it overlapped and then unpicked that so that i could tie them on the back to keep going because again i do think it's it's really challenging to estimate how much you're going to get out of a bobbin Another technique that was mentioned in the art of fabric manipulation is if elastic thread is not used. For example, you do basically a simple gather in rows with a straight stitch, but lots of them. And then you want to stabilize that row afterwards because without the elastic, you run the risk of having that lovely long gather break. Mm -hmm. And so they suggested either using a ribbon backing or even potentially an elastic backing tacked at different points throughout the shearing to support that thread if perhaps you end up with like a break or to keep it from breaking, which I thought was was really interesting. Again, I did go the easier route and use the hand wound elastic bobbin, as I've said, is my technique for my little Sweet Home Alabama inspired dress. And I have a tip for you when you tackle any shirring projects. I had done some swatching on my machine first with the hand wound bobbin, figured out the right tension, and ended up calculating that I was getting about a third of the length post shirring. So I cut a length of fabric for the dress that was three times the width that I wanted to walk away with. Well, it turns out that the weight of that much fabric made the shirring not quite as tight. It was a little bit closer to two and a half times because the elastic wasn't 
as effective once all of that fabric weight was added. So nothing wrong with that problem. It's always good to have extra fabric you can reduce, but just something good to know when you're making that translation from swatch to finished garment when you're dealing with sherry. That's that's true. That's a good tip. And it's definitely something you need to um, play around with and be mindful of. Some patterns will even have you share before cutting out the piece to really ensure that you've got a big enough piece to work with. Like just uh, share like a length. Of yeah, length. yeah, yeah. So there was a pattern in one of the great British sewing bee books. I can't remember which one. And it was a shared dress and the bodice was shared, but it had the bottom of an armhole cut out. They gave you a rectangle sized share, which was massive. And then after you'd shared it, you got another pattern piece, I believe, and laid it on top to cut out your actual bodice. I think that's a good way to do it because you just don't know. I think every fabric is different. And again, even if you swatch, you don't know exactly how much the weight's going to impact it, all those things. I like that technique. Mm. And like we mentioned with gathering and ruffling, once you've mastered shearing, you can have a lot of fun with shearing effects, puff shearing, tuck shearing, layered shearing. And before I decided to do a layered effect on my dress, I did try it out with my swatches, which is really easy. You just put two pieces of fabric together and see how they gather up. I found that having mesh tool over linen blend didn't really have much of an effect on it. I did try it with a couple of different fabrics too, to just kind of see how that layering is. But yeah, don't be afraid to experiment. It's really fun and you get some neat effects with it. Nice. And again, I'd say a sheer dress might be something that you almost don't need much of a pattern for if you want it to be sleeveless. But in case you would prefer a pattern, Tracy, you had some excellent suggestions. Yeah, there's a couple of really nice ones. The first is a free pattern. This is great pattern by by Hand London and it's a shared dress. You can find it on their Instagram stories, but we'll put a link to it in our show notes. It's basically a rectangle for the bodice and rectangles for the sleeves and a rectangle for the skirt. But it's a really nice pattern and they have some nice tips on sharing as well. And it kind of comes up really lovely. I made one a few years ago and it's like a real glamorous and versatile dress that was a quick sew and very impactful. So, yeah, I definitely recommend it if you want to try out sharing. And then another noteworthy pattern that I'd like to point you to is the Deo dress by Sewing Patterns by Mazin. And this dress has sharing at the waist and on the cuffs, but then it's also got balloon sleeves and a neckline and tucks. So it's the kind of pattern that's quite versatile to dress up, dress down, but makes the sharing a little feature of the dress rather than the main piece to it. Oh, that sounds like a, a great pattern to test it out without fully committing <laughs> to too much sharing if you're new to it. <laughs> so shall we move on to smocking? Yes, please. Last year, I took a one day class at New Craft House with Lauren McDonald of Working Cloth. Um, and it was called the Introduction to Hand Smocking. And it was a really, really lovely class. So smocking is about creating a series of gathers and then putting embroidery stitches on top before removing the gathering stitches. And the embroidery stitch allows for the stretch of the garment while controlling the fullness. So some smocking is, is purely decorative and some of it is functional. Um, you'll often see it maybe in bands on children's clothing or more traditionally you would see it in labourers attire who needed a comfortable functioning item of clothing or farming smocks or a smock frock. If you look at auction sites you can sometimes find old smocks from the 1900s or something with these beautiful design details on them. Oh amazing. So to do smocking, you firstly prepare the fabric. So you mark a grid of dots at regular intervals, so like maybe five mil apart. And if you're working with gingham fabric, again, gingham fabric is a real time saver. You can just use that as a guide and say, hmm. a step. You can get things like iron-on transfers or templates or even make your own template out of card if you're if you're doing a lot of smocking and want to make it easier. And then what you do is you use a new thread for each row and make sure to knot it at the end. And you go in on the first dot and out of the next and repeat so that you have a running stitch across the fabric. And then you do this for each row. And then you gently pull the threads and slide the gathers along the fabric so that you get this tight but not too tight kind of light pleat I guess to the fabric and then you want to tie off the ends 
to make sure that you hold the gathers in place, give it a good steam to help set the gathers, and then you're ready to smock or an embroider, basically. So there are a variety of stitches that you can use for smocking. Stitches like the stem or an outline stitch won't give that much elasticity, whereas you can have like a honeycomb or a chevron stitch, which will give a bit of elasticity. And so they're useful on cuffs or on children's clothing. And Tracy, having done this, since this is primarily hand stitching technique, how complicated or challenging would you say it is? I don't think it is complicated. I think it's just the, I think it's quite a nice therapeutic thing to do. The real prep is in marking up your fabric. Once on that, it's something you can just do in front of the telly. And it's quite therapeutic. You want to practice your stitch. And once you've got the, the different stitches nicely practiced, then you can you know, really have fun with it. Okay. There's lots of old books that you can find from the like 70s or something on the subject that you can pick up for a few pounds. So I have Smocks and Smocking by Beverly Marshall, which was recommended on the class and it shows a variety of stitches and application. The styling of the garments is definitely very dated. (laughs) You can quickly imagine how they could be applied to a more contemporary garment. So there's a machine you can get, which is a smocking pleater, which looks a little bit like a mini pasta maker. You can roll the fabric through the needles to get the fabric pleated and um, ready to start smocking on. And there's a few of these brands around, like the princess pleater or the weed smocking pleater, and they're quite fiddly to set up and they're quite expensive, but they do come up every now and then quite cheap on eBay if you are a serious smoker. And you know the question I'm going to ask you next, Tracy, which is, do you have one yet? I I do, yeah. I I talked about it last year. I was going to say, I thought you had one. And while I have never done smocking myself, I think there's a great example in high fashion of the honeycomb smocking stitch from the 2013 Alexander McQueen collection by Sarah Burton. Tracy, you and I saw this in their store exhibit. I think it was two years back now. Yeah. The dress was made with silk organza that was hand smocked in a honeycomb pattern all over with a silk tool and net corset underneath. It was Absolutely incredible. Such an amazing example of how a simple technique, when applied properly, can have this incredible impact. Yeah, absolutely stunning dress. And we've sung high praises of that exhibition before. I really totally recommend it if you find yourself on Bond Street. If you wanted, though, to have a go at honeycomb smocking on your own, Working Cloth has a pattern on their website, which gives an introduction to honeycomb smocking in a square smock top with lots of variations on it and I think it's free I think it's a free pattern so yeah just have a go and that's something that I'm I do want to make because I really think the honeycomb sleeves on it are the cutest little detail I haven't quite got to it yet so that's 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 on the to make list another pattern that I think lends itself really nicely if you wanted to play around with smocking is something like the sage brush top by Friday Pattern Company because it's got a front panel that you could kind of smock and then cut out to be the right size for your top. So yeah, you can have a play around with that and the different stitches and things. I think it's a cute detail. I like that idea, taking a smaller part of a pattern to play around with it, especially if you aren't sure how accurate your calculations are going to be on the pre and post smocking size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. No, don't do calculations. Cut it out afterwards. <laughs> yeah, big takeaway. So Rebecca, of all the things that I read about in preparation for this episode, there's one thing on pleating, this one technique that I really just wanted to get some strips of fabric out and stop playing around with. Ooh, I'm excited to hear. <laughs> so before jumping ahead to, to that particular one, um, pleats where the fabric has been folded at regular intervals and then they're held in place either by basting within the seam allowance and before attaching it to a seam, I don't know, so for example, a skirt on a waistband or stay stitched down vertically if they're longer pleats to be held in place. So I don't know, like clots, maybe you want the the front pleats to be held nicely in place. Um, Or sometimes you may see rows of stay stitching to hold the pleats in place. But once you've mastered pleats, you can really, really play around and the possibilities are endless. One of the most gorgeous effects, in my opinion, is this decorative box pleating, which is literally where you pleat a fabric, a strip of fabric. But this time you ensure that the pleats are the same width as the fabric strip. So, for example, if the width is 10 centimetres, then you'd have half pleats of five centimetres deep. And if you 
Imagine the effect of that box pleating on like an organza strip cut on the bias as a trim for your garment. <laughs> oh, that sounds amazing. Like Just this incredible visual effect. Yeah. And pleating is such a versatile technique that falls into that more controlled gathering category mm -hmm. since the pleats are often so meticulously created. I think we're more often familiar with flat pleats as a technique. Think knife pleats, the box pleats you just mentioned, Tracy, and their counterparts, the inverted pleat. But there are also something called projecting pleats. And I'm, I'm citing my book here, such as double box pleats, threefold pinch pleats, pipe organ pleats and cartridge pleats. <laughs> now, the visual that popped into my head when I was looking at photos of all of these projecting pleats was honestly old curtains that have that decorative gathered bits at the top that fan out. Uh, can you picture that, Tracy? Mm -hmm, I definitely can. Yeah. Okay, great. So that's the pleating technique. And there's so many options that it's really worth playing around with different pleats and even combining different pleating techniques techniques in potentially contrasting directions. Definitely something interesting and unconventional for your garment, especially if you use the curtain techniques. Lastly, there are broomstick and accordion pleats. And if the former two categories of pleats are flat and projected pleats, I guess accordion pleats are non-directional. So it makes sense then that they're in their own category. I can't even picture what a broomstick pleat would be. <laughs> it's basically... It looks, it's like if you're, if you're like an angle and with triangles coming out of it or something. No, it just looked like an accordion pleat, but you didn't meticulously measure. Oh, wow. <laughs> so kind of like a messy accordion pleat. So it goes both directions, but it's pretty narrow. So it does kind of look like the end of a broom. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and you know what, flicking through my book, it, like lots of the bleaching techniques did make me think of upholstery and furnishing, as you say. Yeah. And in and, and a few of the techniques, like the pleating in curtains, but also some bobbling effects you get on cushions and sofas created mm -hmm. by some like creative gathering. There's, there's definitely a lot of inspiration to be taken from the <laughs> upholstery and furnishing world. Yeah, absolutely. Stuff you don't see in clothing very often. Go look at your sofa. <laughs> the takeaway of the episode right there. Go look at your sofa. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most beautiful examples of pleating that I, I think I've ever seen was at the Chanel exhibition at the V&A where there were these most beautiful cloaks from spring summer 1925 and they were made of silk and cockerel feathers actually now looking back at the, the description online there was an auction I think referred to it as smocked and then just thinking back to our conversation at the time, you have these beautiful pleats running down the edge. Mm -hmm. And if you, the closer you look, you could see these little pinpricks near the near the pleats, which suggests that they've done this very delicate preparation for smocking. Smocked a few lines at the top and then removed the gathered threads with these perfect pleats in place. Oh, yeah. Well, because it was silk too. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and it was just like so delicate and how these techniques have evolved yeah yeah over time if the only way to accomplish that absolutely just minute pleating in that silk was to use a thread that you then took out post pleating yeah 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 you can just see these little little couple of rows of smocking stitches at the top which yeah just like the attention to detail absolutely beautiful Absolutely. So if you wanted to play around with pleats, there are lots and lots of patterns that have pleats in them. <laughs> and the one that jumps to my mind is the Nina dress by Fiber Mige. And they've also got a, a really lovely tutorial on how to work with the pleats as well. That's a great idea. And I think another one, if you're looking for a very limited approach to pleats, is if you look at any traditional shirting pattern, we usually have a nice crisp box pleat at the back. Yeah. So if you want just one just <laughs> to play around, with. That might be something to take a look at. Tucks are another form of gathering fabric that also forms a fold, but the distinction of a tuck versus a pleat is that it involves a seam at their base, which is visible on the back of the fabric. This makes them a very structured, stable way to gather the fabric. And tucks are really interesting because 
they can look like a pleat from the outside if that little base seam is hidden in the fold of another tuck. Perhaps most commonly when we think of tucks, we think of pin tucks, which are very small seam sections that are rarely more than three millimeters from the fold to the seam line. The complexity of a tuck comes in when we need to calculate in advance the additional space of the fold as well as the seam allowance. This is when a ruler and your tailor shock can come in handy when you're trying to estimate how much fabric is needed where. And particularly with tucks, it can be really useful to have differentiated lines for what is supposed to be a seam line and what is supposed to be a fold, such as a dash line for the fold, where you're going to be doing the pleating, and then the solid line for the seam line line that will take into account that seam allowance. A clever hack for a tuck that I read about is to use a twin needle and your five grooved pin tuck foot with a tightened tension, which will actually gather your fabric into that tuck as it sews, creating a firmer fabric for you to work with. A five grooved pin tuck foot? I think I need to go foot shopping. <laughs> you know, what's bizarre though is I have one. Oh, wow. I didn't even know I had it. But I saw the photo and I was like, oh, I do have one. But using it with the twin needle will actually create the tuck at the same time. So something we'll have to try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then if you run rows of tucks in crosswise directions, so basically vertical and horizontal, you end up with something called cross tucking, which looks quite beautiful and produces a checked pattern in the fabric, but accomplished only through texture folding and those extra seams. Now, this does eat up quite a bit of your fabric, though, as you're not only creating the fold, but also seaming that fabric closed, not adding any stretch at all. So if you're considering adding tucks to an existing pattern, you definitely want to do a swatch first and then adjust your pattern piece to add that needed fabric to end up with the same size result after you add your decorative details, a lot like all of the other techniques we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. But this one has an added element of rigidity to it that will make that math really important. Ooh. And lastly, there's also something called a tied tuck, which is done without a seam line and instead uses a stitch between lines outlined on the fabric. And honestly, it sounds basically like smocking to me. One might argue that it is the same thing, just you don't have that gathering step in advance. But the pattern outcome from this type of hand tucking can be quite dramatic, almost like 3D compressed shapes. If you were doing the tied tucks in a square grid-like pattern, you end up with these kind of crinkled squares next to each other. And it's really beautiful. Going back to my Pinterest board, Tracy, <laughs> I've pinned so many photos of this effect, but had no idea it was tucking until researching for this episode. Well, there you go. Sounds like you've got to <laughs> I try out some tucks on your, on your next make. If you wanted to have a go at tucks and use a pattern so the, the sums are done for you, then take a look at the Tilly and the Buttons Marnie dress because that's got some nice tuck details to it. It does. And Tracy, I looked that one up. It's actually considered a combined tuck, which is interesting because you're seaming in two directions on it. But the effect is really dramatic. However, the technique really, it sounds way more complicated than it is. So mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think that pattern is absolutely brilliant yep. to play around with. I think it's worth giving a little bit of time to the techniques that can be learned from quilting and applique. They don't all lend themselves to fashion garments, but there are some really fun things you can create if you play around with some of these techniques. Quilting, I'm sure we're we all know, is where you have three or more fabric layers that you've stitched together. So after you've basted your layers together, you quilt your design onto the fabric. You could use like a long running stitch by hand or do some stitching with your machine. And a quilted jackets have been really popular of late. And so, I don't know, you can imagine the fun you could have if you quilted your own fabric first before making up a little jacket rather than buying some pre-quilted fabric. It's again one of these areas like you said at kind of the beginning where it's not always the technique that is associated with fashion garments but when it 
is, it can be so impactful. And I do think there's so much opportunity for us to cross disciplines. And then applique, which is about adding fabric for decorative purposes, is something else to think about. So normally you would heat fix into place and then stitch either by hand or by machine different layers of fabric. So I don't know, for example, you put a circle onto your fabric and you and stitch around the edge of the circle. And you can play around the stitches here depending on the effect that you want to get. So you could have like a satin stitch for a more solid outline or free motion embroidery for something a bit more challenging or, or freer. And then there's the reverse of that, which is called reverse applique, where you layer your fabric and sew them together and then cut into the top layer to reveal the fabric underneath. And so with this, you need to be mindful of your fabric choices. You obviously don't want fabric that's going to fray. But you can imagine like a simple sweatshirt pattern and putting applique on it to create your own Christmas jumper or whatever you want to do. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a technique that, that you should have in your arsenal. And something that's great if you're looking at repairing and upcycling as well. Really handy technique. Yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. So if you needed inspiration for like a simple sweatshirt pattern that you could play around with some applique, have a look at the Linden sweatshirt by Grain Line Studio um, because that lends itself nicely to a nice big panel that you can work on an applique. And if you wanted to try and quilt your own jacket and you wanted a pattern to give you some guidance, the Tamarack jacket, also by Grain Line Studio, has all the instructions you need to quilt your own design and then make a jacket. Something else that I saw in my book, Tracy, was the concept of a stuffed applique. So instead of quilting a raised surface mm -hmm. into your garment, you stitch the applique and then cut a little hole in the backing and then stuff it mm -hmm. to raise it up. And the effects that they showed in their samples were just so interesting. I can't even think of where I've seen that used before, but just another very unconventional way to apply this that would be really interesting oh, in a garment. That would be fun. Well, a close cousin to quilting is surface cording. When we're talking about cording, we're truly talking about exactly what you think that rope-like cord material. They can also be used under a layer of fabric or between two layers of fabric, which is very similar to quilting and is just kind of a different form of stuffing and guide to use when you're creating decorative detail. So one way to create a corded motif in your fabric is to first stitch the pattern into two layers of fabric using either a twin needle or two parallel lines. Mm -hmm. And then you thread the cord into the motif using a tapestry needle, entering the channel from the seam lines. The other technique involves placing the cording in the desired pattern between the two layers of fabric first, then stitching on either side of the cording, capturing it in place, and very helpful is is the cording foot to do just that. It keeps it in place. You might see it more regularly as just like a nice detail, but honestly, when I think of cording on something, I think of edge of upholstery. <laughs> Can you think of any garments that use cording, Tracy? Funnily enough, I just made one. The pattern fantastic ether dress. The structure on it is anchored by this rope <laughs> that kind of ties off the center front and it gathers and it's just like it's basically using a cord to hold everything together. It's a pretty cool design. It came together quite nicely. Well, there you go. We've dipped into high fashion a little bit throughout these explanations, but we have some really good examples that we wanted to save till the end. And Tracy, you're actually going to share some for us today. <laughs> well, the first one is Molly Goddard. And when you think of fabric manipulation brought to real life, she is, well, for me anyway, obviously the first name to jump to mind. Same. Smocking and sharing and ruffles and tools and taffeta, they really are her signature. And there was a Guardian interview with her back in 2016 
where she talks about how her team were preparing for the autumn winter show and they had been busy running fabric through her Sally Stanley smocking machines so that they could be ruched up into tiny little gathers because she was not able to find a factory that could do it. And so basically they were just doing it themselves on, and uh, which really limits the orders. I, I mean, I don't know how it's changed because obviously that was like eight years ago. She's definitely someone you think of when it comes to that kind of fabric manipulation. In the same article, it also talked about how she'd recently introduced sharing because it's done with elastic. It can be like done on an industrial scale. So it really does go to show the kind of the difference between smocking and sharing. Absolutely. And I just love Molly Goddard's work too. I was watching a YouTube recently and during the video, she just whipped up a little smocked dress for her friend's kid. Oh, wow. And I was just like, wait, you just and like as the interview is happening. So even though I'm mean, clearly to scale her business, she has to find different techniques that allow her to produce different types of garments to be able to just grow the business. But still, she clearly is just such an expert on being able to use the traditional techniques in interesting ways. It's yeah, yeah, really yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. They all just are so just fabulous, fabulous yeah. pieces. And then I want to reference a designer who I've only been following for a few months, basically mm. since Joe Wiley wore one of her dresses at Glastonbury. And one of my friends sent me a text message saying, are you watching Glastonbury? Have you seen Joe Wiley's dress? Quick, turn on the TV. <laughs> so this is Karina Bond and her dresses are these incredibly unique, futuristic pieces. And there's like laser cut silk organza frills and hand gathered panels and sculptural shapes. And it's like a real feast for the eyes, her Instagram feed. So I highly recommend having a look at Karina Bond. I think that's something that's so interesting about fabric manipulation is that we do associate it with high fashion, mm -hmm. yet so much of it is rooted in historical garments mm -hmm. and these classical techniques that, as we've talked through them, really aren't that complex, but it's just taking the time to add that extra detail, whether it's before you make a garment or during the process that transform these into runway ready look. It's definitely worth trying these techniques to up your garment stuff. Yeah, exactly that, Tracy. So really, really yeah. will add, add so much to your home makes. As we've said throughout this episode, we've got some fantastic books that we've referenced and some wonderful websites. And we will share these in the show notes with you. Absolutely. So Tracy, what are you working on next? Well, I am going to finish my twirling of my dress that I mentioned earlier, and then I'm going to make the real dress. And then we're heading into Autumn, and my eyes are very much set on what coat I want to make next. Is that too soon? Same. <laughs> no, same. I saw TikTok today that was making fun of everyone who was saying that fall or autumn is just around the corner. And I am 100% with you. I am that person. The weather can't cool down fast enough. <laughs> I just love making coats. And you or I are on the same page coat season. <laughs> Coat season is just around the corner, hopefully. And in our next episode, we will be discussing unconventional outerwear. We were so taken by some of the silhouettes on the fall runways. Single piece front coats at Bottega Veneta with underarm godets, crop trench coats at Chloe and capes, capes, capes galore. We cannot wait to start tackling these fall trends in our next outerwear makes. And our next episode, which I guess means I'll need to start making a coat then. <laughs> Tracy, what do you think? <laughs> I think so. But before our next episode, if you have any thoughts, ideas or questions for us, you can always find us on social media at Threaded Together Podcast. And if you enjoy listening to our shows, we'd love it if you give us five stars and leave us a review. It helps other people find our podcast. It does. In the meantime, I'm Tracy. And I'm Rebecca. And this has been... The Thread It Together podcast. See you, See you next, next time. time. Looking forward to our next episode in a month. Make sure you give us a thumbs up on Apple Podcast or follow us on Spotify. You can find more details on what we discussed today in the show notes below or on threadedtogetherpodcast.com. And for more behind the scenes and regular updates, you can find us on all social media channels at Threaded Together Podcast.